to the Private Tenancies Coronavirus Modifications Bill, I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargy, to move the bill. Thank you. I beg to move. Thank you. Members will have a copy of the Marshall List of Amendments detailing their order for consideration. The amendments have been grouped for debate in the provisional grouping, am grouping of amendments selected list. There is a single group of amendments, amendments 1 to 14, which deal with support for tenants and assembly oversight, and we will debate the amendments in turn. The group includes amendments on an extension of the notice to quit period retrospectively, draft affirmative procedure, and rent waiver. Once the group debate is completed, the other amendments in the group will be moved formally as we go through the bill, and the question on each will be put without further debate. The questions on stand part will be taken at the appropriate points in the bill. If that is clear, then we shall proceed. The Group 1 amendments for assembly oversight. So we now come to the single group of amendments for debate. With Amendment 1, it will be convenient to debate Amendments 2 to 14. Members should note that Amendments 8 and 12 are consequential to Amendment 1. Therefore, if Amendment 1 is not made, I shall not call Amendments 8 and 12. Amendments 4, 5 and 6 are consequential to Amendment 3. Therefore, if Amendment 3 is not made, I will not call Amendments 4, 5 or 6. Amendments 10 and 11 are consequential to Amendment 9. Therefore, if Amendment 9 is not made, I will not call Amendments 10 and 11. I call Mr Jerry Carroll to move Amendment 1 and to address the other amendments in the group. Mr Carroll. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I want to move Amendment 1, uh, and I'm glad to have the opportunity today to strengthen the, the necessary legislation to protect renters um, during this pandemic. And indeed, that is uh, the aim of each of my amendments. Um, no one in this chamber uh, will be or, or should be uninformed about the, the crisis facing renters, particularly those who are low-paid workers who have lost their job as a result of the <coughs> coronavirus, uh, or students who have had to leave their student uh, rental to isolate in family homes are now being forced to continue to pay for a tenancy for many months despite no longer living there. And unfortunately, we have uh, heard of disgraceful stories where healthcare workers have been evicted with 24 hours' notice by their landlords for fear that they might uh, carry the coronavirus. Uh, whilst most people are out clapping for and praising our NHS workers, some are shockingly trying to capitalise out of this crisis. Distressingly, we have also heard stories in which an estate agent in Belfast, confident that they cannot obtain rent from their student renters, have sought to recoup this money from the renters' guarantors uh, at this time. And that, uh, this is shocking behaviour, uh, Mr. Speaker. And my landlords can obviously avail of mortgage and rates relief. Uh, some have uh, seen the current crisis as an opportunity uh, to extract more from their renters, and we should all condemn this shameful behaviour. I want to stress, uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, that even if all the amendments I move here today are accepted, this piece of legislation will not go uh, far enough, in my view, to protect uh, those rent renters that I mentioned. It will be a good beginning, a good start, for sure, uh, but there needs to be urgent, stronger legislation to ensure that those who no longer uh, have a need for a property can end their tenancy contract early, uh, and also those who have been financially affected by the crisis are given a waiver of their rent. It would be better, moreover, um, if this chamber would, would waive, uh, waive rents for this period uh, completely. Uh, it's not something so outlandish at this time, and indeed it's been uh, measures uh, such as this have been taken elsewhere to protect the vulnerable. Uh, another possible workaround could be to cap rents to housing benefit levels uh, and extend housing benefits to those who have been uh, affected by the crisis to pay their rent. Uh, I would appreciate if, uh, if the Minister could clarify if Stormont has the ability uh, to cap the rents um, and whether she is uh, herself in favour of this measure. Uh, moving on, Mr Speaker, to the particulars of the amendments I am moving today. Uh, I want to be clear that without a rent waiver or rent cap uh, in place, my aim was to limit uh, the amount of evictions during this period as far as, uh, as possible. While we are asking people to stay at home uh, to prevent the spread of this virus, we should do whatever we can to ensure they have a home uh, to stay in for their own safety, the safety of uh, their community and our health workers. 
and to prevent hospitals from breaching capacity. Someone evicted during this period would not only lose their ability to isolate, but the means to find a new home uh, are severely restricted, obviously, by social distancing protocols and by the probability that those being evicted have found themselves in financial hardship because of this crisis. It is highly unlikely that we will uh, have fully lifted the social distancing protocols fully, and nor the advice to stay at home, or indeed the advice that all non-essential staff should not be at work within the next 12 weeks. Indeed, it would be profoundly dangerous, based on the World Health Organization's advice, to do, to do so. And we have heard that a vaccine for COVID-19 may not be available until next year. We know it is very likely that we will have a second wave of this virus. So while a three-month extension in the original bill is certainly welcome, unfortunately it does not go far enough. The Irish Government, the British Government and indeed governments around the world, along with chief medical officers and the World Health Organization, estimate that COVID-19 and the measures, uh, the measures necessar necessary to prevent it uh, and its spread will be with us probably into 2021. And we must ensure that we are not only adhering to that advice, but, uh, but we have protections for renters for as long as those COVID-19 measures are in place. That is why my uh, amendment number one uh, seeks to extend the eviction notice period to one year. Amendments one, three, four, five, and six uh, and seven allow for the amendment, this amendment to apply thematically throughout uh, the legislation. Uh, and this bill, without the amendment around extension of the length of time applicable, therefore, would allow landlords the possibility to begin evictions in July or shortly thereafter. Uh, the next aim of my amendments, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is to allow renters who receive an eviction notice during the time when this bill was introduced uh, and when it was given royal assent to avail of the extended notice, uh, notice period. This is a simple enough measure, I believe, which would allow. Uh, as many renters as possible to avail of the new protections and for us to implement those new protections as early as possible. Unless there are robust guidelines in place that covers renters for the period of time just before this legislation is finally implemented, then they are left exposed and, legally speaking, their landlord could begin eviction procedures. This would obviously uh, be the detriment to the detriment of vulnerable renters, students, people in low, uh, low pay jobs. And for that reason, Amendment 2 seeks to extend this notice period uh, retrospectively from the date this bill was published. Amendments 2 and Amendments 8 to 12 allow for this amendment to apply thematically as well throughout the legislation. The final amendment, <coughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, Amendment 13, I wish to bring aim to inject greater democracy into the legislative process. The amendment, if accepted, would mean new legislation uh, relating to exceptions to the extended notice, uh, notice period would have to be voted on in this House. Currently, the bill does not stipulate for this. I believe that it is imperative that MLAs are allowed to properly scrutinise and approve those measures by way of a positive vote in this chamber uh, and ensuring that necessary oversight and accountability is possible. At a time when states have been imbued with far-reaching powers, uh, we must ensure that democracy uh, is not encroached upon at any stage in this Assembly, especially when COVID-19 measures are being implemented. Indeed, we should strive to guarantee as much oversight and accountability as is possible during these unprecedented times. And throughout this crisis, I and my party have always called for maximum democracy uh, and, and scrutiny. Uh, if new guidelines are to be implemented, Mr Deputy Speaker, in legislation, Surely members should have the chance to debate, discuss and, if necessary, uh, amend them. These measures would affect a lot of my constituents and many other uh, uh, constituents in this House, and surely we should settle for nothing less than maximum uh, scrutiny at this time. Uh, I want to end my comments uh, there, Mr Speaker, and I therefore I commend amendments to the House. I will be moving uh, amendments 1 to 13 and not be moving amendment 14, just for your reference today, Mr Speaker. Thank you. I thank the member. Given that I had said that around 10.50 uh, we would suspend the sitting in order to allow parties to make arrangements to observe the minute silence for frontline workers, by the leave of the Assembly I think we should suspend now because it is 10.47 just to give people time to put those arrangements in place. So sitting is suspended. Thank you. Until 11.05, not indefinitely. I want you back here at five past 11. We return now to the private tenancies bill consideration stage, and the next member that I had listed on my speaking list was Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and today I stand um, to speak as a member of the Democratic Unionist Party and not as chair of the committee, um, as the committee has not had time 
to scrutinise these amendments, and therefore I can't give um, a committee response on that. Um, and in saying that, I, I, Mr. Carroll brought up the point about um, scrutiny and the lack of scrutiny. We, uh, uh, again, as a committee, we very much were of the same agreement. We very much would like to have more scrutiny on this, and we would have liked to have had more. I certainly would have liked to have had more scrutiny also on your amendments, um, but sadly that wasn't possible. And I know it is in the times that we're living in has made all of these things not possible, where we have had to rush through legislation. And um, and I think that the, the 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 crux on that though is that the legislation has to be proportional. And I think and I believe the legislation as it stands is proportional um, to where we are at the moment. And I do know that within uh, the legislation also, within the bill rather, um, there, are clause, or there, there are two clauses there that will allow for this bill to be altered. Um, the, the, I suppose I just had a, a small debate there with some other members around clause 13, um, where uh, the committee has the, the right um, uh, to bring this back, or th th this can be brought back to committee where committee can extend it or whatever the case might be. Um, and you had said that you would prefer that it was also the assembly as well as the committee um, that look at this. And in, um, in normal times, I will be saying absolutely, I wholeheartedly agree with that. My only concern there is that we could be in the middle of summer recess. Not that I think summer recess will be like any other summer recess we've ever had before. Um, but uh, that would just be my only concern there, um, that um, we, we uh, would have to wait further length of time in order to give notice or whatever else for the Assembly um, to reconvene, so that would be a concern on that. Um, I also thank, I thank the member actually for highlighting some of the issues as well that um, we <coughs> had spoken about whenever we got our committee brief um, from the officials, and I know very much um, that there are a lot of people who are going through some really bad financial uncertainty at this moment in time, and many people who have, who have lost their jobs. And I would like to think wholeheartedly that those there, the safety net there is in place to help those people when it comes to housing benefit. But the, the member did bring up a very good point around housing benefit and about the rates cap, because not all private uh, rentals are of the same level as housing benefit would be. So that would be just as a concern that I would have that maybe the minister could address um, that also, um, I also have been lobbied and have been contacted by various members um, within my own constituency. Um, I say I, I think actually quite a lot of them have been that 80% furloughed group who have contacted their landlords to say, "Look, I am a nigh 80% furlough. Um, can I have a 20% reduction in my re rent?" And landlords have come back and said, "No." I think that's scantless. I think that's absolutely dreadful where these people who, who, through no fault of their own, have been put on further furlough and put on reduced wages and landlords have not responded to that. So I think that is something we need to be encouraging and we need to be saying as part of this that it, landlords have a responsibility there also um, for those people that want to pay their rent, albeit at a reduced rate. Um, I also uh, feel for, for that age group. We know that uh, in today's times, um, a lot of, uh, certainly my own children included in this, don't leave home until much later on, so they are living with their parents. But then we do have that cohort, sort of between 25 and 35, who have left home, who are in private rental because they can't afford the 20 per cent um, deposit to buy a house, but are saving. So that worries me also that they have lost their jobs. They will have an amount of savings there that they have been saving and working really, really hard for um, to build up a deposit, and that is seen as savings then whenever they're applying for, for their housing benefit. So I, I, you know, in, in all of the legislation that has been passed here over, over recent weeks, there are swings and roundabouts, roundabouts. There are people who will benefit, and there are others that will fall through the cracks, and it will be much more difficult for them. Um, I, I'm also a little bit concerned about uh, 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 extending the period, given the fact that we know that the, the so-called mortgage holiday is set at three months if that doesn't continue. Um, well, there are many good landlords out there. There are many landlords who are, are helping their tenants and that are, you know, are actively helping them and speaking of good, good relationships. And I know there are many bad landlords as well. Um, that uh, people are living in some really horrendous conditions in some private rentals. Um, so I, I, I would worry about those landlords that are, do have paid pay to or, uh, the buy-to-rent mortgages 
um, when their mortgages then uh, have to be paid again because the mortgage holiday is over, um, if we were to run this any longer or any further, um, we could end up then with repossessions from banks on those uh, on those buy to rent mortgages. Sorry, go ahead. Way, and, and she raises a very important point. Would she agree with me that it is important within the contents of the bill that we allow for the flexibility of this House to react as and when this situation develops? You have mentioned uh, potential uh, changes in terms of mortgage interest rates, etc. It is important that this House maintains the control and, and the ability to act as this, as this situation unfolds. The member for his intervention, and absolutely agree. And I think that is part th that we have that within the bill that, that we can react, that we can extend this, that this can um, we can make those decisions going forward. Um, I just want to make some one other point, and uh, member had raised it, and I've been lobbied also about the students and student rents. Um, and I know this does not fall um, wholly under uh, the Department of for Communities. Um, but I know for many students they will have left their, their rental properties and will be now living back with their parents. But I know for others um, they actually live in, in their student accommodation is their main place of residence and they have no choice whether it's, whether it's overseas students or whether it's other students who don't have a home to go, home, to go back to. And I do think that we, we need to be protecting those students that they can't face eviction. Um, and I think that needs to be done, of course, in collaboration with the Department of, of the Economy as well. Um, so I know it's not doesn't fully lie at the, the floor of, of Minister Hargay. Um, I, I agree with the member's sentiment. I get it absolutely. I know that he is trying to his very best to look out for those most vulnerable people within our community. But I would like to think that when we come to near the end of the 12-week period, that um, this will be brought back to the committee where we can look at this again. And if need be, if this needs to be extended beyond that, then we take that. Uh, proportionate approach going forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Call Ms. Sinead Annis. Uh, last can call you. Mr. Speaker, let's just call a spade a spade. What we have here in these amendments is unnecessary time wasting. Now, we've all become depressingly familiar with publicity before people's self aggrandizing brand of politics. But to use the passage of this bill, which is designed to protect those within the private rented sector, during the biggest health emergency in a generation for their own propaganda pur purposes is reprehensible. Proposing amendments that are either legislatively redundant, highly susceptible to successful legal challenge, or outside the legislative uh, competency of this Assembly tells me, quite frankly, that Mr Carroll hasn't done his homework. We spent considerable time in this chamber last week arguing the need for this bill to pass, and to pass quickly. This must happen in order for the protections contained within it to be effective now when they are needed. To not support this bill, or worse, to cynically delay it in an attempt to gain some perceived political advantage, will put lives in danger. That cannot and will not be tolerated, and it begs the question why Mr Carroll would bring such ill-thought-out amendments to this chamber in the first place, and whether he has considered the potential consequences, consequences of selfishly prolonging the passage of this bill. The Minister's focus, and our focus here, is on protecting people, not grandstanding. The real action and the genuine attempt to, to protect people in the private rented sector has been taken by this Minister. This bill is necessary and it provides those in the private rented sector with some protections during this crisis. This bill will ensure that in circumstances where someone in the private rented sector is struggling to pay rent through no fault of their own, that they have the certainty of a roof over their heads and that their landlord cannot move to evict them at this time. Introducing amendments that would make, us, make it harder for us to protect those people is quite frankly baffling. And for that reason, we will not be supporting these amendments. We will be supporting the bill as proposed by the Minister. Thank you. I call Mr Mark Durkin. Thank you very much, Mr Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I have approached today's debate like I approach every debate, and that is with an open mind and determined to secure what is best for people. I did speak at length last week on what elements or aspects we in the SDLP might, in normal circumstances, use this piece of legislation as a vehicle to deliver, primarily a specific focus on students and the hardship that the current situation is causing them. 
I lamented the fact that this legislation could not have been done sooner and that there was no provision to apply it retrospectively. But I also, following conversation with representatives of some of our most respected, responsible and reasonable groups working in the housing sector, accepted the need for speed and their concerns that even well-intentioned, apparently helpful amendments may have unintended consequences and jeopardise even a bill which, though not perfect, is certainly a very welcome piece of legislation to protect people in the private rented sector. While we as a party have therefore resisted tabling amendments, that is not to say that we would or will view unfavourably any amendments that are tabled. I certainly understand and appreciate the intention behind Mr Carl's tabled amendments to afford what, on the face of it, would appear to be to ensure more protection for tenants and to do so for longer. To extend the period of protection against the issuing of notices to quit from 12 weeks to one year. Last week, I emphasised the importance of flexibility so that there was or is a mechanism whereby the period can be extended if necessary and for as long as necessary. The Minister was, at that stage, able to give the assurance that this is the case. It is imperative that we, as an Assembly, do everything that we can to keep a roof over people's heads and food on their tables during this crisis and beyond. I would invite the Minister to reaffirm this position and to outline also what risk there would be in changing the period to a year with the same flexibilities in place to reduce or end that period of protection uh, when necessary, and that will be crucial to determining how we vote uh, in, in this debate this morning. If we can already do what Mr Carl's amendments are asking uh, us to do, then what is the point of those amendments? Uh, I know Mr Carl has said now that he will not be moving assembly, or, or, sorry, amendment number 14. I am glad to hear that, because that is one we certainly would have been uh, uh, voting against them was certainly, in my view, superfluous. Uh, the, the, the other amendments do deal with the extension uh, of the period. I think it is vital that people out there know that we are doing all that we can uh, to protect them, and I do not think it is the place for political point scoring from any side. You know, I do not think anyone should be attacked or demeaned for, for bringing um, amendments to a piece of legislation either. Thank you. Call Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like the, the honourable member from across the benches from up the, the north of Northern Ireland. Uh, we don't believe that uh, Mr. Cal would be bringing these amendments for political purposes, but that he has a heart for putting the roof over people's heads. However, that's not to say that we will be supporting the amendments in this case. And the bill was drafted by the department, and whilst not perfect under the circumstances, we feel it uh, proportionate. It is essential that as a government we strike a balance and ensure we provide the best possible support for all of our citizens across this country. It is also worth remembering that there are good and bad landlords, as, uh, as my hon. Member uh, did allude to. And likewise, there are good and challenging uh, tenants. However, across the board, the majority of landlords and tenants are good and enjoy good relationships. I am aware of landlords who work to support their tenants at the moment, uh, where they can during this pandemic, and I am engaged in dialogue in more complex examples. Uh, the Government have announced a number of support packages which should help support those who have been affected by this pandemic. And as has been highlighted, there is the job retention scheme, scheme, discretionary housing payments, and other avenues of support that I would encourage tenants to explore should they experience financial hardship. The Department's Make the Call service is a useful resource that can assist with navigating the social security system and eligibility criteria. And we would call upon landlords to work with tenants and where they can and support and assist one another through this difficult period. And where a tenant is struggling, it is absolutely essential that they engage with their landlord to try and find a workable solution. This is already happening, and it is imperative that dialogue does indeed continue. Turning to the amendments before us, Mr Speaker, 
We feel that the amendments go beyond proportionality. There is no doubt that we should be doing all we can to both protect and support private tenants. However, this cannot be achieved through the alteration of the notice to quit uh, period alone. Financial support packages are actually crucial. Research would indicate the majority of private sector landlords are not large companies, but individual landlords with one or two properties. Therefore, as I previously mentioned, it is imperative that the bill is proportionate. The burden cannot simply be passed over to the landlord alone. There is a collective responsibility. Amendments 1, 8 and 12 would all alter the notice to quit period from 12 weeks to one year, which we would not support. Amendment 2 and 7 deal with the date in which the bill has an effect. The bill, was, the bill as drafted would take effect the day after Royal Sent. With Mr Carroll's amendment, the bill would take effect from the 21st of April 2020. However, as we understand from the Minister, this would be problematic. Therefore, further clarity from the Minister would be required. Amendment 3 would change the ending uh, with date of the bill from the 30th of September 2020 to one year after the royal date of assent. However, subsection 3 of the bill provides for the Department to amend by regulation, as required, the ending with date, which is sufficient we believe should it be required. We therefore do not support Amendments 4, 5 and 6 as they are mutually exclusive with Amendment 3. Amendments 9, 10 and 11 deal with the power to alter notice period. Under the Bill, the Department can, by regulation, alter the notice to quit period from 12 weeks to 6 months or any other specific period which is less than 6 months. We feel that this is reasonable and proportionate, therefore we do not support the amendment. Amendment 13 deals with regulations under subsection 1. As drafted, they would be subject to negative resolution. However, we would be prepared to support the amendment, which would require a draft of any proposed regulation to be led before and approved by the resolution of the Assembly, allowing for democratic scrutiny and accountability. And like Mr Durkin, we were glad to see Amendment 14 uh, was taken off. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I call Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I join with others in commenting the fact that when you bring forward amendments to this place, it is not done for political purpose, but it is done with the best will, and I do believe that people before profit have tried to do this today. Um, but what I would disagree with with Mr Carroll is when he talked about um, he doesn't want people to be evicted. Um, he doesn't want people to lose their homes. One of the ways that people can lose their homes is if their landlord is bankrupted. And one of the issues that we have seen with this coronavirus and this pandemic is the fact that people who are running businesses, those landlords are also under pressure. And while that some of them have a mortgage um, rent per, or a mortgage holiday period, um, I would be expecting those landlords to pass that on to their tenants. I believe that the bill as it currently stands, most of the amendments I cannot accept. To ask a landlord to give someone a year's notice, and maybe that tenant is someone who hasn't paid their rent and, and then won't be paying their rent for a year, effectively puts that business out and means that any other tenants could also lose their homes by the very fact that that landlord was out of business. Um, the landlord-tenant relationship is not dealt with within any of the amendments or the bill. What we are finding now are landlords who are putting pressure on tenants. That's not something we can legislate for. What is contained within this bill is a notice period that may be extended, and the period of the bill can be extended to cover people during this emergency. Perhaps we could have, with the committee, um, a further discussion with the minister at a point after this terrible pandemic is over to consider what improvements we could make in, make in the long term to private tenancies. But for now, let's get over this piece. I cannot support the extensions that Mr Carroll is looking for. I don't think that they're reasonable. I don't think they're in keeping with the emergency situation that we're faced with within this bill. However, I will say that I can support Clause 13. I believe in openness and transparency in the democracy of this place. I believe that there is time. The Minister knows that the 12 weeks would take us if someone was to serve that notice as soon as it gets royal assent, that the notice period would end at the last week of July or the first week of August. There is time, therefore, to bring in front of this House amendments to extend that period of time if we are still within the lockdown period and if we are still within this pandemic um, stage by the end of June. So what I will say is I cannot support any of the other amendments. I don't think that they serve more of a purpose. There is an issue, however, before I finish, just about students. Students have asked a lot of us 
about the issues that they have been having. Less of it is about being evicted and more of it is about contract law. There must be a way that we can work on contract law with DWP um, and any of the other devolved nations to think about students and the contracts that they undertake so that when there is a pandemic or a crisis like this in the future, there may be a breakaway clause that people can break that contract earlier and therefore will not be faced with the same financial penalties of trying to meet rents that they're, for places that they're not living in. So that's a different matter. But for Clause 13, I do believe that this Assembly is somewhere that this should be brought back to, that we should have the right to consider. If we're not going through all the stages with committees, then this House should have its democratic process. Thank you. I call Mr John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, Preve Las Cancordia. Uh, I, I am going to say Mr Carroll is being political, and that's not an insult. He's a politician in a political chamber among other politicians. Why wouldn't he be political? If he's not being political, we're in the wrong room. We're in the wrong building. It's all politics. So let, let, let's not be naive or, or shy away from the fact that people in this room conduct politics. I'm proud of it myself, and I'm sure you all are proud of it as well. So let's do politics. Let's create politics. But let's make politics work. And the difficulty with Mr Carroll's amendment is, and everyone who has rose to speak thus far have admitted it. Many of them are unworkable. Many of them are unnecessary. And other terms have been used. They're not proportionate or they're not reasonable other than perhaps one, one's floating about as an idea some people are having in relation to Clause 13, which I'll return to uh, in a moment. But the question in relation to, and I enter any debate in relation to legislation, is one, is the legislation necessary? Does the legislation carry out the function for which it is required? And of course, can it be improved on? And I think the legislation that's before us is necessary and it carries out the function that is required. Mr Carroll referred to, in his opening remarks, reports of health workers being evicted within 24 hours by unscrupulous landlords. And I too have heard those reports, and I don't think it's been in the North, I think it refers more to Britain. But let's be very clear about this. And I said this in my last contribution to this debate a few weeks ago. It is against the law currently to evict a tenant with 24 hours notice, or a week's notice, or three weeks notice, or wherever it may be. No landlord can put a tenant out on the street without the proper court procedures. So Mr Carroll's amendments will not resolve that issue. If you're an unscrupulous landlord and you pressure and, and put your tenant out, it doesn't matter if it's a 12 weeks notice period or a one year notice period. You're unscrupulous and you are acting outside the law. So what we have to do uh, as advocates for citizens is ensure that citizens know their rights and send out a very, very clear message from this chamber that no landlord can evict you without the proper court procedures. And what is in the, currently within the bill will offer you further protections. But it's like any law or any piece of legislation. Unless it is used and enacted and enforced, it is useless. So. Let's ensure each and every one of us ensure that the law is enforced going forward towards the future. The issue of students, I suppose understandably, arises during this debate because students have found themselves in very, very difficult positions, as have many landlords who are renting out to students uh, as well. But the minister told us in the last debate that she doesn't have the authority our delegated authority to deal with the students' issue. It's civil law, uh, it comes from Westminster. So why raise the expectations of students who have emailed, many of who have emailed us as, as MLAs, that somehow or other Mr Carl's amendments are going to resolve that issue? Because they're not. So let's be honest with our constituents as well. As well as being advocates for our constituents, let's be honest with them. The Minister cannot deal with that issue because she does not have the legal authority to do so. Either it is this Assembly, either it is Mr Carroll, and if by some miracle his amendments passed, then that would not become law because it would be ruled out of order. So let, let's, let's be, be honest with our constituents in regards to that matter. 
In relation to Amendment 13, I, I fully adhere to scrutiny of legislation, scrutiny of ministers, scrutiny of the executive. There's no question that that should be uh, anything other than, than detailed scrutiny. But this legislation can be scrutinised by the committee. The committee has to deal with these, these matters. And during these, these uh, difficult uh, and very worrying times, um, then there is a role, and we, we will do things in a different way. This legislation has been done uh, in, in a very different way. But the committee's role is paramount, and the scrutiny of the minister will uh, be, be maintained. And there is the issue of what if, during the summer recess, there's a requirement to do something and the Assembly's not, well, the Assembly may be sitting during the summer, we don't know, but during the summer recess, what happens during that period? Uh, and the Minister can't act, can't act in the way it's needed to be acted. We're left in limbo. So there is a solution to Amendment 13. And so when those who talked about uh, it's not proportionate or not reasonable, Amendment 13 is not necessary. It's not necessary because there is Assembly scrutiny of the Minister and her powers. But I suppose the most damning line from Mr. Carl is this. He said that even if all his amendments pass, the legislation will not be good enough. Well, that begs the question to me, why did he not bring forward the amendments which would have made the legislation good enough? He had an opportunity to do so. He's tabled 14, going to move 13. So it comes back to my original point. Mr. Carl is being political, as he has a right to do so. But the question I think he has failed to answer, is he being legislatively competent? And I don't think he's passed that question or that test. So uh, we'll be voting against the amendments as tabled because we believe that in the circumstances, the Minister's legislation offers the protections required at this time to those who she can offer protections to at this time. Thank you. I call Ms Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I rise in support of the bill today and to set out some views on the amendments while supporting Amendment 13. I also wish to thank the Minister for bringing uh, the bill forward, as well as the countless other measures her and her department have announced recently. It has been extremely active and willing to move on many issues, and it must be noted that this is another measure introduced to try and protect people in light of the pandemic. Northern Ireland is, a highly, dependent, um, is highly dependent on the private rent rented sector to meet housing need in the absence of a robust social housing new build strategy. This is a wider issue, but must be recognised here that the loss, potential loss of a section of the private rented sector leaves the market open for large-scale investment by absentee landlords more interested in profit than people. We do not wish for this to happen, and the best of a bad situation must be reached. A number of people are not protected under this legislation, and it must be noted from the outset, as other members have been and did today and last week. Students and those on fixed-term tenancies, and those who are guarantors for students, not being released for the tenancies early. Negotiations with land landlords are recommended, and anything agreed needs to be in writing. Unpaid rent can constitutes a break in the agreement, and therefore non-payment could open up legal proceedings. I hope that the Minister can engage with the Minister for Economy and others to try and address issues for student tenants who are facing this at the moment, but I do welcome the financial support payments that the Department have put in so far. The Bill does not change the process for eviction, nor can it be described as a ban on evictions, and I think it's really important to reiterate and make clear to this as many people as possible. This simply changes the length of a notice to quit to 12 weeks, with two circumstances that mean the notice cannot last longer than 12 weeks. It doesn't prevent tenants from being evicted to the emergency period, but it is unlikely that any evictions uh, will take place until the guidance to the court changes due to the current guidance from the Lord Chief Justice, which is welcome, but it doesn't protect tenants from eviction. The bill does not protect those who commit serious ASB during this period, but without being too descriptive, who decides on what serious ASB is? It also doesn't mention anything of licensees and that there is a risk that they will face homelessness, but I wish the minister to address this later on. It doesn't apply retrospectively, and this is something that Jerry's, uh, Mr. Carroll's amendments on my rating try to address. But I wonder, whilst this doesn't take away from the stress and awful situation that people may find themselves in, do we know how many people this could affect, this could affect if the date was changed to the 20th, 21st of April? And legally, can this actually be done? 
which is also crucial to this. We do not want to see anything been dragged through a legal battle, either as a tenant, a landlord, or indeed the department. And I hope that the minister and landlords and tenants will all take this on board. The proposed amendments seek to provide much needed long-term security and peace of mind for those experiencing financial difficulties. And in submitting them, the good intentions are clear. However, they raise a number of issues. Extending the notice period to one year effectively means that a tenant could potentially accrue significant amount of arrears, i.e. not paying rent for months and months, and a landlord would not be able to seek a court order for eviction until the year is up. Given that many private landlords in Northern Ireland only, only own one or a small number of properties and pay mortgages through rental income, then the potential loss of income could mean a serious level of repossession and landlords losing their property. And through what I raised earlier on the private rented centre being cru crucial for housing in Northern Ireland, this is problematic. Legally, interfering with a landlord's right to evict could raise the prospect of a judicial review and on the basis that the state cannot determine how an individual's property is to be used as the amendments have a potential effect of allowing the private tenant to live in a property without paying rent for a considerable period of time, could these amendments then be subject to legal challenge and the original intention of extending notice periods as soon as possible would therefore become difficult to enact? We would need further clarity on this. So given the impracticalities of the proposed extensions to the notice period and the emergency period, it would be difficult to support these amendments in their current form. The issue of assembly oversight is something that is worth discussing further and a very interesting point to raise. Amendment 13 has the effect of changing the procedure through which the department can amend the notice period and the emergency period. Instead of this being done through regulations, the proposal is that changes the notice period or emergency period may not be made unless a draft of the regulations has been laid before and approved by the resolution of the assembly. We would welcome this. By opening up the possibility of a greater level of scrutiny by the whole house, Amendment 13 does appear to provide assembly oversight of when and how the notice period can be changed through regulations and this is definitely something that we will support. The more chances that we're given to do any scrutiny rule, the, the better. There are a number of questions though I have here on the practicalities of the bill in general which I would like to raise. Firstly on communication. How will the contents and provisions of this bill be explained to landlords and tenants and how will it be disseminated? There needs to be clear, concise direction issued as to what this legislation actually means and what it doesn't mean. There are another key statements and this guidance need to be made around this bill, especially that it is not a payment break for those renting and also how can landlords be protected from losing their properties at the end of the exemption period? What more could lenders do? Secondly, that happens if tenants decide not to pay rent and do not enter into a negotiation with landlord. What happens then? Landlords may be very worried about this and will be taken as an excuse by some to stop paying rent and issues such as debt and arrears could have unintended consequences. So how will the department define the exemptions and level of proof should they agree to extend the period? I would urge anyone in this situation to utilise the services that are available for mediation and housing advice, notably the ongoing work of housing rights. We would wish this bill to go further into many other avenues and in order to address the fundamental need to protect those in long term who rent. But we understand that the legal and practical difficulties of implementing them. And so we would urge the minister and her department to keep this issue under constant review and beg forward such measures if required. This bill cannot be seen as a simple solution to a complex problem, but we must ensure that relevant changes are made as soon as possible. We therefore will be supporting the bill in order to ensure the best mitigation that can be made through an expedited process now alongside Amendment 13. Thank you. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hardy. Minister. Yeah, thanks very much. I suppose just to thank all of the members um, for their contributions and obviously to the proposer in terms of uh, these amendments. And obviously I'm going to group them as well in terms of the four effects. Some of the amendments are obviously, I know one's been taken out. But I suppose in general, I would ask members to reject these amendments, um, as although I'm sure the member who has proposed them has done so um, in a good spirit, they either have no effect or would risk reducing the protections to tenants. And I suppose that's the key thrust for me. This isn't your normal private tenancies bill. Um, and obviously, I would bring a more comprehensive bill. And I think that's the first thing. Obviously, I would want that to have the full scrutiny of this House and also of the committee. But as has been said over the last few weeks when I've been in here, bringing a number of emergency pieces of legislation or regulation changes, we're not in normal times. We're in a crisis. Uh, we're in a public health emergency. We're in a global pandemic. And what I'm trying to do as Minister um, for Communities is to respond to that global health emergency 
in as quickly a time as possible. And at times that does mean that I can't bring things through the proper processes, but that doesn't mean that you can't have the oversight. Um, and obviously that is important. But what has to be at people's minds um, at the foreset is to ensure that we aren't delaying these protections being brought in. And that is the big concern for me, is that any on-due delay means that people are not protected and we extend that for another few weeks. And I just think that that is unacceptable um, for anyone, and particularly because you have all been engaging with people who are being impacted. I think it's also important, um, as agreed last week, I mean, as I said, the legislation should move as quickly as possible. And I think any changes then will mean a delay in this legislation going through. That will mean a delay in the protections. And I can understand people want oversight, they want accountability, 100%. I mean, the normal run of things, that's what it would be. Um, and I would have no problem. I do weekly tie-ins with the chair of the committee. I know the committee are keen to scrutinise and to go through these. But any delay will mean that uh, tenants will uh, be unprotected for a period. And that's the concern for me. In terms of the proposal to change uh, the 12-week uh, period to the notice of quit to one year, and believe me, I've tried to push this issue as much as I can in terms of giving as much protection as I can. But obviously, this amendment would distort the balance. Uh, this bill strikes between a balance of rights, and that's the fundamental issue in terms of that it would distort that. It would mean that the bill was outside uh, legislative competence, and it would likely be challenged, um, and we know that. And what, we're, why, what I'm also being informed of is that that challenge would likely be successful. So therefore, while it may be a good intent to bring that amendment forward, what it would mean that if the bill was passed, that it would do nothing and that it wouldn't protect anyone because it would fall in that legal challenge. And therefore, there would be no protections uh, for tenants. The extension to 12 weeks is proportionate. Um, it is a proportionate response to the current crisis. And the reason this has brought this isn't your normal piece of tenancy, private tenancy legislation. This amendment, these amendments are brought in response to the public health emergency that we're facing. The other issues then will be debated um, in its proper manner in terms of primary legislation being set. But we're not in that, we're not in that space. We're responding to this public health emergency um, and an emergency that we have never seen in our lifetime. And I think that in terms of the 12-week period, that is tied to the shielding period, the public health advice that is saying that people need to shield for a 12-week period um, if they receive their letter. And we know as of last week, uh, people are still only receiving those shielding letters from their GPs. Um, and that is to protect the most vulnerable and have the ability, um, obviously, as was said, for by to let landlords to have the three-month more, uh, three mortgage holiday. Therefore, I do consider uh, the interference with the landlord's property rights um, as lawful, it's justified and it's proportionate, and that it is an appropriate balance that has been struck to address the public health emergency in this period. In terms of the amendment to request the bill to take effect from the 21st of April, this would obviously engage in retrospective um, aspect of the legislation, uh, which was considered during the policy making process, and I know I touched on this last week as well. And as I said out last week, taking account of legal advice received, I don't believe that it's possible to do so without making the legislation vulnerable to legal challenge. And my reason for not moving on this, I would love to retrospectively have this legislation put back. The difficulty is then you get into a legal challenge, you get into a legal debate. And again, this will delay this legislation. The whole point of this legislation is to bring in protections now not to bring them in in two weeks, is to bring them in now. And any legal wrangling, any argument or, or disagreement will delay this bill from being implemented. So therefore, what you're trying to do, you're actually working against what you're saying that you're trying to do. And that's the concern then in terms of trying to get into the debate around retrospective uh, planning. In terms of um, to have the regulations extending the relevant period beyond 12 weeks, so to look at draft affirmative, Again, this amendment um, would make it more complex if I needed um, to extend the notice to quit period. In all cases, these regulations are scrutinised by the committee. Um, but by the main reason to reject it, it's a very practical one, I suppose, on my part. 
um, it would mean that if there was a scenario in which the Assembly wasn't sitting, whether if that was a result of the coronavirus, um, and again, we don't know how this is going to unfold over the coming weeks and months, or possibly because of the summer recess. And again, that's why we've went through this accelerated passage. That's why we've tried to hear this bill over two days rather than over an extended period, because we're trying to move it as quickly as possible to offer those protections. Now, again, if the medical advice comes out after the 12-week period saying that there's a second spike, um, that there may be a new wave, that we still need people to shield, I need to respond to that as quickly as possible. Now, I know that that in my current legislation means that you don't have the full and proper scrutiny, but surely people can understand the reasons or the intent of why I'm asking for this to be done. Because what I don't want to be in a scenario that if there is a summer recess, if the Assembly's not sitting, then I can't table these regulations. What I am given a commitment to do is that they will have the proper scrutiny of the committee. I can give a commitment that I will engage early in terms of that scrutiny to allow the committee and the members of that committee to take the time to look at that if there is a need to do it. And again, this is all predicated on what the public health advice is saying, what the medical advice is saying, and that will be assessed as we're moving through uh, this in the coming weeks. So I would ask uh, for that uh, amendment to be rejected for those reasons also, um, and for me to take that forward. I know the last amendment was obviously withdrawn, but obviously my department did issue guidance to tenants and landlords a few weeks ago. We know that that guidance will be taken into account um, by the court service. We have had engagement with the court service. We have had engagement with the Lord Chief Justice. And again, I would just urge people, I mean, I am bringing these protections in to try and protect the most vulnerable at this time as a response to the coronavirus. This isn't trying to change the whole private tenancies bill. That will be at another stage and we'll have the proper consideration. This is about bringing in protections here and now that no one will be left homeless during this public health pandemic. Any delay in this by a week or by two weeks could push it back because it has to be redrafted. It has to go to DSO. It has to go to the Attorney General, back to the Executive, into the committee, and then a result back to this chamber as well. And that's the concern for me. That's the only overriding fact for me. Um, and I want to get the, these protections in um, as soon as possible. So I would ask uh, members to um, reject the amendments um, that are there at this time. The last thing I just wanted to add on, because it was raised in terms of the housing benefit, obviously housing benefit and universal uh, credit, there is a housing cost element. People are entitled to the local housing allowance. And obviously this was set at the bottom end um, of the private rents. And in the past few years, this rate has obviously been frozen. The local housing allowance um, freeze was lifted, and it's actually been increased for everyone. And also due to the coronavirus um, outbreak, uh, people becoming unemployed uh, can now apply for discretionary housing payments, and that is to have their full rent covered for the 13 weeks. And this extends to the protection of housing benefit to universal uh, credit claimants also. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I call Mr. Jerry Carroll to wind. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll, I'll do my best to try and sum up uh, and reply as much as I can, but there's obviously a lot in that. So, but thanks for the members' uh, comments and contributions. Uh, uh, Paula, Paula Bradley obviously um, uh, raised concerns, generally speaking, um, about the need to have more scrutiny. Um, she said the legislation has to be proportional. Um, in some of our comments, and, and generally speaking, I, I would respond to that uh, by saying that I think, generally speaking, legislation there isn't enough legislation in place um, across the board that supports residents, uh, uh, renters, sorry. Um, and if we are to be proportional, then we need a, a lot more legislation uh, in place to to support uh, renters. Uh, she said that uh, she is not going to support I think any of the am amendments, if I'm correct, and summon her position up. Um, the the uh, Sinead Ellis from Sinn Féin um, said there was a, an attempt to delay, cynically delay, I think, uh, this um, this bill by the amendments. So I would put to her, I mean, the real question for her and her party is wh why she and her party doesn't support uh, amendments which strengthens the rights uh, for uh, for tenants. Um, Mr. Darkin made a number of comments, uh, and he obviously defended the right uh, to make amendments. 
perish the thought of members trying to make amendments in a political chamber, uh, and he defended the right uh, to do so, and I thank him for it. Uh, Mr. Butler uh, raised concerns um, about, I think, all the amendments, but he indicated that he's supporting Amendment 13, um, and he made some other points, obviously, uh, as well. <coughs> Excuse me, Kelly Armstrong um, uh, similarly uh, said she cannot accept most of the amendments. Uh, she raised concerns about uh, the financial situation of some landlords, um, and as, as she said she cannot support uh, the amendments apart from Amendment 13. And she also suggested um, the necessity, or certainly the consideration, of a breakaway clause uh, for renters uh, at some point in, in the future. Uh, Mr. O'Dowd said uh, quite a lot. Um, a unworkable, not proportionate, uh, uh, some of the stuff not legislatively competent. I suggest he speak to the Bills Office, who said that this, it was, uh, these amendments were legislatively competent, uh, competent um, they were workable and they were uh, proportionate. So I suggest he speak to the Bills Office on that. No, uh, on that. Um, and I'm, I'm disappointed that the response um, from some in this chamber to my amendments, which uh, sought to strengthen this bill in the interest of, of renters, was one of attack uh, from some in the chamber. Um, and I want to thank those in the chamber uh, who took seriously the intention of the amendments. Uh, and to be very clear, Mr. Speaker, uh, that these amendments were made in conjunction with renters and housing activists, and they are, in my view, uh, and theirs, what is necessary to protect people during this crisis. And it is very telling that it was met with uh, defensiveness and deflection and attack in, in, some, uh, in some quarters. And obviously, Mr. O'Dowd uh, mentioned um, politics and the right to be political, but I think there's a difference between politics and just sheer political uh, point scoring. Um, Rachel Woods mentioned concerns about uh, renters and students um, and the need for security for tenants. And she uh, said she'll support uh, Amendment uh, 13, which in my view, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is essential. Um, I mean, generally speaking, you know, there, it's accepted, or it seems to be accepted, that we've learned the lessons uh, of RHI in terms of democracy, scrutiny, accountability. Uh, then, if that's the case, then I would implore and encourage members to support uh, Amendment 13, if not for any other reason than, um, than that. And, and I am quite concerned that there was reference made and talk about, and uh, quite a number of comments about a summer break. And, you know, I take the point, but I mean, surely we shouldn't be considering um, summer break before you know having legislation which is strong enough and doing whatever we need to do to make sure that's in place to protect renters and people generally uh, uh, in this in this situation. And just generally speaking, uh, we obviously are in an emergency situation, and emergency measures are needed. And if they are subject to legal challenge by landlords, then I think there's an onus on this house and ministers in this house that challenge them, that challenge landlords in the courts if necessary, and to stand up for. Uh, and support uh, tenants uh, and people here uh, in rental accommodation. Uh, and just in closing, um, the minister mentioned a number of points about a, a, balance of right, uh, a balance of rights. I would challenge this again. I think we need to be standing up for renters at this time, and not enough has been done uh, to do that. We've seen measures in place for landlords, and nowhere near enough measures in place uh, for, for renters. Uh, and like I said, we shouldn't be afraid of challenging landlords, even if that means uh, in, the, in the courts. The Minister also mentioned about the 12-week uh, period in, in, guide, uh, in line with the guidance around the shielding um, letters and, and announcements made by um, the NHS, but obviously, as she will be aware, uh, most medical officials, most uh, organisations such as the World Health Organisation um, have stated that uh, this crisis is likely to go, to go beyond uh, 12 weeks. And a vaccine, like I said earlier, is not going to be available likely until uh, next uh, year. So I want to uh, commend um, the amendments to the House, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope the House will be kind with me. I have never been through a list of 14 amendments before uh, for vote since taking up this office. So I think it's probably three years from this House is considered a substantive piece of legislation. So. If we're all nice to each other, we might get through the other side of it. Amendment proposed to Clause 1, page 1, line 5, leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 1 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any? No. no. I think the noes have it. Amendment 2 has already been debated. 
I call Mr Cherry Carroll to formally move Amendment 2. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 1, page 1, line 9. Leave out and insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 2 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. No. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Amendment 3 has already been debated. I call Mr Jerry Carroll to formally move Amendment 3. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 1, page 1, line 11. Leave out and insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 3 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. I will not call Amendment number 4 as it is consequential to Amendment 3, which has just not been made. I will not call Amendment 5, as it is consequential to Amendment 3, which has not been made. I will not call Amendment 6, as it is consequential to Amendment 3, which has not been made. Amendment 7, has already been debated. I call Mr Jerry Carroll to move formally amendment number seven. Moved. The amendment proposed clause one, page one, line 18. Leave out and insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that amendment seven be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. The, I will not call Amendment 8, as it is consequential to Amendment 1, which has not been made. Beg pardon. Yeah. Amendment 9 has already been debated. I call Mr Jerry Carroll to move formally Amendment number 9. Amendment proposed to Clause 2 page 2, line 5. Insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 9 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. I will not call Amendment 10, as it is consequential to Amendment 9, which has not been made. I will not call Amendment 11, as it is consequential to Amendment 9, which has not been made. I will not call Amendment 12, as it is consequential to Amendment 1, which has not been made. Amendment 13 has already been debated. I call Mr Jerry Carroll to formally move Amendment 13. Moved, Mr Speaker. Amendment proposed to Clause 2, page 2, line 22. Leave out and insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 13 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. no. Aye. Aye. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. I remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place must not come to the chamber. Order. Members will resume their seats, please. Before I put the question, I would again remind members that, if possible, given the current climate, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division of the House. The question is that Amendment 13 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, if any, no. no. Aye. Okay. Vote it is. Um, do we have tellers?
Order. Tellers have been appointed as follows. The tellers for the eyes are Mr Jerry Carroll and Mr Robbie Butler. The tellers for the nose are Ms Sinead Ennis and Mr Johnny Buckley. Before the Assembly divides, I want to remind you that as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and must not enter the lobbies. It is important that during any division, social distancing in the Chamber continues to be observed. In order to facilitate this, I would ask members to do the following. Any members in the Chamber who are not due to vote in person should consider leaving the Chamber until the division has concluded. Those members who wish to vote in the lobbies on the opposite side of the Chamber to which they are sitting should leave the Chamber via the nearest door and enter the relevant lobby via the rotunda. Those remaining members who are sitting closest to the lobby doors should enter the lobbies first, and any member who has voted may then wish to leave the chamber until the division has concluded. I remind members of the need to be patient at all times, to follow the instructions of the lobby clerks, and to respect the need for social distancing. Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Order. Members will resume their seats and the clerk please read the result. 83 members voted, 30 members voted aye, 53 members voted no. The motion is negatived. The motion has fallen. Will members just give us a few moments while the clerk and I change around at the top table? Thank you. Order. Members. Question is the clause one stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Question is the clause two stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 14 has already been debated. I call Mr Jerry Carroll to formally move Amendment 14. Not moved. The amendment has not been moved. The question is the Clause 3 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to Clauses 4 to 6. I propose by leave of the Assembly to group these clauses for the question on stand part. The question is that clauses 4 to 6 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the long title be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. That concludes the consideration stage of the Private Tenancies Coronavirus Modifications Bill. The bill will now stand referred to the Speaker. The next item of business is the second stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. I call the Minister for Justice, Mrs Naomi Long, 